Thank you, George. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, all the other speakers today have focused very much on agronomic risks, and quite rightly so. My job is to try and consider all the other risks being faced by arable farm businesses today, try and give some perspective. It's a very big subject to cover in 25 minutes, uh, and I apologise in advance for, for covering some fairly serious and sobering issues, but if nothing else, it will give you something to think about on your way home, and I promise absolutely to finish on a positive. So, risks in perspective. Much like the couple in the car, I'm sure they've got their seatbelts on, but they've missed the elephant standing in the middle of the road. So what is risk in this context? Well, for, I'll, I'll go through that um, but just to set the scene, and I'll uh, talk about why risk is relevant today, because I think it's probably more relevant today than it, than it ever has been. I'll have a quick run through of how we manage risk, uh, looking at how we identify, evaluate and prioritise, and I'll take some practical examples from the, the Monitor Farm programme. For those of you who don't know about the Monitor Farm programme, it's something that's very close to my heart. Uh, I was involved in establishing the programme in the East region uh, last year uh, and have now taken over responsibility for the, the programme across the country. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about it later on as we go through picking out examples. But basically the premise is that you take a real commercial arable farm that's typical of conditions and, and factors in its local area and you use it as a live case study. We look at agronomic issues, we look at financial issues, but the point is the agenda is very much set by the people who get involved and look at all the various decisions going on, on that farm as they relate to their own business. And, and that's really why I put the strap line up there. It is farmer-led and farmer-driven. We're just there to resource it. But what it does do is bring out some very interesting issues and examples of how those issues might be, uh, might be solved. So, risk in this context. Um, We've talked about many definitions already today. The definition that I'm going to use is it's an uncertain event that could have an effect on the achievement of objectives. Now, those objectives may be to do with profit, they might be to do with costs, they might be to do with financial security. But the, all risks that I'll be talking about can either be a threat or an opportunity. And I think it's very important to remember that. We always tend to think of risks as a threat. But you'll see as I talk through on today on the presentation that equally the flip side of them is they can be seen as an opportunity as well. But each carry a different value, and that different value is based on those three key factors up there, probability, proximity, and magnitude. Probability, clearly the likelihood of it happening. Proximity, when is it going to happen? And magnitude is how big is that impact going to be on my business? Why are such risks particularly relevant today? Well, I almost dread saying the word volatility because it's used so much in everyday conversations and the press and everywhere else, but we can't get away from it. And I think the double whammy we have to deal with now is that we not only have volatility in the short term, but we're seeing volatility within the medium to long term cycles that we've been used to in farming for many years. So we've got sort of an extra dynamic to deal with, and that's why we're seeing big variations in both cost and price. And so the magnitude of the risks that we're facing are much bigger than perhaps they ever have been. And I think added to that, slightly bluntly illustrated by the picture on the slide, there are holes beginning to appear in the safety nets that we've been used to relying on. On the other side of it, we have got much more information than we've ever had before, uh, and that allows us to do real-time risk management. And it's very important that we use all of the tools that we've been talking about today in the earlier presentations to make sure that our farm businesses are profitable for 2020 and beyond. Why do I choose 2020? It's not just because I like numerical symmetry, although that is true, but 2020 is when this current regime comes to an end, as we all know, and who would bet against the value of uh, farm payment support, however you want to call it, coming down at that point? I don't think anyone in this room would do that, given the economic and political situation in the EU before you even begin to think about whether the UK, how the UK referendum pans out. The, 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 um, the sort of viability of payments going forward is a really big issue for us all to consider. So what I wanted to talk about a little bit was about the illusion of profitability. Uh, the bars up there are total income from farming up until 2014, uh, and that would give you a, a good indication that the profitability of the industry is fairly strong. If we consider one of the extreme scenarios where support after 2020 disappears altogether, then that reduces the profit line down to just bumbling along it just in the black. And actually, 2015 and 2016 would probably see that line drop further. If we were to pay a rent on every acre of land that we farm, then that line comes down further again. And if we were to pay every farmer a living wage, 
then the line come down further again. That means that the industry is not truly profitable. It is in cash terms, but it's relying on a number of factors that are artificial. And I would suggest that if we haven't got true profitability, it's going to be very difficult for us to achieve true resilience. A little bit about asset base, cheap money, interest rates, uh, macroeconomics. I think up till now it has been providing a false sense of security, and I'll try and explain a bit more about what I mean. Farm borrowing has increased year on year since 2006. Uh, a lot of that's been on the back of uh, the trend in land values that have increased incredibly in the last 10 years. That trend has come about because largely, there are a number of reasons obviously, but largely because the rest of the economy has been struggling and investors have been switching their money away from the poor performing sectors of the economy and putting it into land as a safe bet. How long that will continue for is, any, is anyone's guess is as good as mine, but the point is it probably won't continue forever. And we've got to start thinking about what will happen if land prices stabilise, or even worse, if they start to come off. Interest rates, we all know what interest rates have done. They've been very low since 2009, and this has masked the risk attached to this growing level of indebtedness as against the land values. I think the other thing we need to bear in mind here is that a significantly large part of the industry and probably the area of biggest growth is that of contracting and tenancies. Now, contractors and tenants don't have the security of a, la a land ownership, and so they haven't got the option to sell land if things get really bad. They haven't got that emergency backup scenario, and so they're already looking at every cost and price decision much more closely. I think uh, a quote from JFK is a very good way of summing up the position they face. The farmer is the only man in our economy who buys everything at retail, sells everything at wholesale, and pays the freight in both directions. And I think that just sums up the, the situation being faced. In graphical sense, uh, the graph that I've just put up demonstrates how uh, variable costs and fixed costs have increased year on year in the last five years. But that effect has been slightly hidden from us by the fact that output has been doing the same. And, and I think rents are a, a very good example of, of that scenario. We, we've sort of all bought into this philosophy of rents going up but because output's been going up. Output has stopped going up, and yet rents and various other costs are yet to change. If we add in the, the, the trajectory of uh, output against the increasing cost line, we now see that gap beginning to narrow, and I would suggest that if we had the official figures for 14 and 15, that gap would be probably closer again. We need to start, as an industry, restructuring our cost base to ensure that that gap remains viable uh, and so that we have a resilient business going forward to deal with the, the re any other potential reduction in output. So this brings me on to the need for resilience. I think we all accept that risk-taking is inevitable. I would suggest if you don't like taking risks, then the farming industry probably isn't the right place for you to be. And because businesses operate in a changing environment and change creates uncertainty, you need a really good understanding of risks and the choice of responses to those risks to, in order to achieve resilience. Resilience in this context is the capacity to adapt quickly and successfully in the face of risks, and this capacity needs increasing now through innovation in the way that we manage risks. I am putting up this model as an example of how that can be done. There are many others out there. I quite like this one. I think it's a very simple one that can be adopted, periodically reviewed and communicated to everyone in the business. It's a simple four-stage process of identify, assess, plan and implement. So as it says there, how do you start? Well, you have to first identify the risks you're facing before you know what to do about them. A quick 15-minute exercise on the Monos Farms came up with more than 30 risks, and that was just in 15 minutes, under the headings that I've put up on that slide. Uh, production, obviously, mostly to do with the weather. Legal, environmental regulations kept coming to the top of the list, and I don't just mean about the failure to comply. Coming back to some of the other issues we were talking about earlier, obviously, the, the potential loss of key actives also comes in as a, as a big risk going forwards. Price volatility we've already touched on. Human risk can be anything to do with shortage of farm labour or succession issues. And financial exchange rates was the one that kept coming to the top of the list, but it could also be interest rates. So how do you juggle more than 30 curveballs while running a business? At this point, I wanted to start throwing balls into the audience to illustrate the point, but I was told that that was too high a risk given the situation, so I'm just going to do a simple illustration instead. But this is where we really start talking about keeping risks in perspective. Uh, it's very important that all of the risks are evaluated in monetary terms and ranked in order of size based on their impact on the business, and this helps us to prioritise both our management time and increase resilience. 
So a quick example from our Stowe Market Monitor Farm. Don't worry too much about the figures. It's the principles that are important. But as you can see on the slide, we were looking at the value of their BPS payment, uh, wheat sales based on uh, just over 3,000 tonnes of wheat from the harvest, 63,000 litres of farm diesel being purchased, just shy of 400 tonnes of fertiliser, and we looked at the role of rape in the rotation. As I go through this, I'm hoping you'll pick up on another uh, sort of part of this process, another message, another advantage to what we're doing here, is that many small improvements have a very big impact on profitability. If you could just improve, no, no one can get every decision right every time, but if you could just improve 10 things by 10%, it has a huge effect on profitability and, and resilience. So let's start off with exchange rates. I know we're talking about BPS, but I'm just going to very quickly expand a little on exchange rates. Exchange rate is probably the single biggest effect that we, ha we face on profitability uh, that we can't influence. And that's largely because of the effect it has on both the price of exports and the cost of imports. We know all that. Here we're talking about BPS uh, and the issues that have been going on in the EU. We know the euro is struggling with the debt crisis in various countries and we know the pound is rallying on the back of a comparatively stronger economy. That's what the exchange rate has done over the last two years. And so for the Stowe Market Monitor Farm's BPS payment, that change in 23 cents equates to £20,000. Wheat futures. This is not a story that anyone likes retelling, but I think it is important just to make the point at this stage. Uh, when the wheat futures uh, price for November 15 opened in July 2013, it stood at £165 per tonne. If we bring ourselves forward to last month when it closed, it finished at £110 a tonne. I don't need to point out the maths, but a drop of £55 per tonne over that two-year period is pretty staggering, and the effect of selling at the beginning or the end of that period has had a massive impact on profitability of different farming businesses. So at Stowe Market, with their 3,000 tonne plus harvest, that had a, a figure, uh, uh, could have had an effect on profitability of 183,000. I think that figure pretty much speaks for itself, but if you want to put it in sort of reality, if you just imagine taking that figure off or indeed adding it on your bottom line, it demonstrates the importance of getting that price right and managing that risk. And those that were taking the view of managing risk by selling forward have certainly seen some of the benefits of that. Diesel price. Pub chat with farmers gets very excited about diesel price. Uh, actually, does it have an effect? Does it not have effect? Who's got the best deal? Who hasn't? Well, it is important, and, and certainly the drop in the crude oil prices has been very welcome. Uh, in terms of the Stowe Market farm with its, uh, its 20,000 litre purchase or whatever it was, drop in 19 pence per diesel, 12,000 pounds, and I can't resist saying that's not to be sniffed at. Okay. Uh, fertiliser prices, a similar story. Um, obviously the drop in oil has seen a drop in fertiliser prices. I apologise for the gap in the graph. The genuine reason is that the person responsible for putting these figures together fell off his bike. And so there is a gap in these figures, and because he didn't do a good enough risk assessment, we haven't got a complete data set, so I had to put that in there. <laughs> but the point is, you get the picture, the price started high, it dropped off, and so in terms of a purchase of the four, just shy of 400 tonnes of fertiliser, drop of £60 a tonne, that has a value of £22,500. So the total value of those four decisions, all right, you could argue there are probably a dozen or so phone calls around that, but ultimately four business decisions tot up to a total value of £240,000 on or off the bottom line. The simple message to take away from that is that every single decision we make now has a, has a huge value because of the volatility we're facing, but I think more than anything it demonstrates the, the fact that we must start investing considerably more time and effort in the process of grain marketing as a market function. Yield is extremely important, it is the main driver of profit, I firmly believe that, but you would not get any fluctuation in yield in this country that would generate the same sort of variation as we do get with price. The Stone Market Group also wanted us to look at Aussie rate and its position in the rotation. So we came up with a method of doing this by looking back over the last five years and looking at the average crop loss under winter wheat and winter rape. You could put any figure you like in there, depending on what relates to your own farm experience. But the idea is you take that percentage chance of loss and multiply it by the costs that you've invested in that crop at the point you decide to walk away from it and redrill in the spring. And that gives you a risk value per hectare. And it indicates the issue with rape in that it has a lot more risks attached to it than, say, a crop of winter wheat, but um, very similar cost base. And so the risk value is much, much, much greater. And as Caroline was talking about earlier on, our little friend in the picture below has added very much to that debate. 
So let's look at the risk versus reward of rape and the rotation. It's a big fluctuating area, much more fluctuating than uh, many of the other crops that we grow, and that's largely because of the price, change in price. It's, uh, it's very much that when the price is high, the risk is considered to be worthwhile, when the price is low, it's not. And certainly at the moment, with, with, with prices where they are, we're definitely seeing people reduce their rape area, or in some cases even walk, walk away. That has quite a big impact on rotations, and I'm not convinced that that sort of pendulum approach, which I'll talk about a bit more in the moment, is quite the right way to go about it. In my view, 2012, we was, uh, that sort of level of oilseed rape was arguably far too much for a rotation to be sustainable. I would suggest that the area we're going to see in 2016 would suggest a much more balanced rotation and a much more balanced position for the market in terms of supply and demand. So, uh, we can compare gross margin and, and net margin. In the past, gross margin analysis has shown winter rape to be a very attractive break crop. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the pendulum swung a long way across one side and created an imbalance in the rotation and we've all uh, experienced a number of problems as a result of that. But there aren't that many viable alternatives. We still need rape in the rotation. It's still needed for balance. Uh, and I think w what we really need to do on each farm is start trying to get to the bottom of the true picture of how all the various crops fit into the rotation and what's the net margin of the overall rotation to make sure that we're, we're designing the best rotation for our farm rather than just reacting to, to some of these market signals. So if we look at gross margin versus net margin, these are standard figures. Uh, I would encourage everyone to, to calculate their own. Any of the participants in the Monitor Farm program use our crop bench, um, benchmarking program, which allows them to look at the net margin of the whole rotation and calculate their cost of production. But even based on these standard figures, you can see that the gross margin for oilseed rape looks quite reasonable, and yet by the time you get to net margin, you start seeing a negative return. So some conclusions from net margin analysis. If you compare fixed cost costs between different farms, you will find that fixed costs are generally much more variable than variable costs. And so the scope to reduce fixed costs is much greater. Uh, and, and the advantage of reducing those as opposed to your variable cost is you, it can be done without impacting on yield. When you think about the significant investment in land, labour and machinery, any cost reduction in that area is immediately reducing your risk, therefore reducing your exposure and increasing resilience by reducing that risk. You've got some key choices in trying to achieve this. You can keep your cropping system but reduce your fixed costs to, to, to meet that either by joint ventures or, or more informal machinery sharing arrangements, or you could change your cropping to reduce the fixed costs. Uh, an example of that would be shifting some of your winter drilled crops over to spring zone to spread that peak labour machine requirement, reduce that overall capacity need and spread the cost that way. Some may even be able to achieve both. I just want to talk a bit more about spring cropping while we're on it. I'm, I completely accept that spring crops, um, as Simon was alluding to earlier, are not without their own risks, but... Uh, when you think about the opportunity they give to save costs in the current climate and you then look at black grass, uh, there is an argument to say that spring cropping should be further up the agenda than perhaps it is. Basically what those two graphs are showing is that when prices are high, you can afford to have a yield penalty on your second wheat as a result of, say, something like black grass, and it's still more profitable. When prices are low, spring barley suddenly climbs back up the agenda, and any kind of loss of uh, yield through black grass on second wheat means it compares less favourably to a crop of spring barley. That's just one example. We could look at that in multiple crop situations. The point I'm making is spring cropping may well be a solution in certain situations on certain farms where you're trying to reduce costs and deal with the weed burden. So what's the, uh, the ultimate aim of all of this work and all of this analysis was to produce a summary risk profile. Uh, and I think this is a very good way of formally managing risk on a very complex farm business. Uh, it basically plots every risk against probability and impact. I've simply put that up there as an example. Every profile for every farm will be different. And in order to cover all of the risks that you face on, a, on an arable business, it would need to be much bigger. But I think it starts to give you a way of prioritising your management time and increasing resilience. A little bit more of practical risk management, just to, just to make sure that you don't think the monitor farms is all about analysing figures. 
Uh, we've looked at, spent a lot of time in soil management, doing things like finding ways to increase organic matter, reduce traffic, I improve drainage, which is ultimately all about increasing the soil's ability to deal with extreme weather events. Uh, we've been looking at varietal choice uh, with Simon uh, to do things like reduce disease risk, uh, spread maturity across harvest, uh, rotations in terms of long-term sustainability to improve soil, reduce weed burden, reduce disease burden, and again spread the workload. Pest and disease monitoring has been uh, very well covered by Caroline and Jenna. Uh, these tools are out there and, and certainly they should be used to, to best advantage. When you're looking at spring cropping in particular, uh, I, would I, I would certainly um, look, make sure people are looking at uh, the idea of contracts to lock in some of the premiums that are available. Labour and machinery comes down to sharing to try and reduce that huge cost, particularly with things like depreciation. Simple things like checking insurance is adequate. Stress testing budgets, I think, is probably one of the most useful things that can be done. You set up the farm budget and then you stress test it for different levels of BPS, different price levels, different costs, uh, different interest rates. Uh, if you think that we've got half percent as a brace rate now, uh, there's every chance that we could have two more percentage points on that by, say, 2017, 2018. And if you run a farm cash flow through that and you look at the impact on repayments, it's, it's quite staggering. So I would, I would encourage people to stress test their budgets at this opportunity. And then we get into wills and agreements to protect the financial and legal position of the, uh, of the, uh, of the business. I don't want you to think that I'm obsessed with elephant analogies, although I do think size counts. Um, but I have two more elephants for you before we leave. Uh, sorry, this was just showing that all of that's ultimately about increasing resilience. It's not a great subject to do at the end of a presentation, just before we break for Christmas, but uh, you've got to bear it in mind. Uh, how many businesses do you know and can you think of where the husband and wife are joint partners, joint tenants or joint directors in a business? I would suggest probably most of them. Uh, our friends, our positive friends at the ONS tell us that 40% of marriages won't make it to the 20th anniversary due to either death or divorce, uh, and 60% of those don't have a business plan in place to deal with that eventuality. So I've seen a number of businesses, and we've discussed them through the Monitor Farm programme, that have done everything else right and then fail because they're very reluctant to address a very difficult issue. And I say, I do apologise about talking about before Christmas, but if it makes people go out there and actually try and get their house in order just on that one subject, then it will have achieved a lot more security going forward. Uh, my advice is, buy more Christmas presents. <laughs> right. To summarise, uh, there are many threats and opportunities out there, uh, and hopefully my presentation has, has indicated that. We've got to be proactive in risk management. Doing nothing is no longer an option. Hoping is not sufficient. We've got to have a formal plan in place. It doesn't matter what sort of business you've got. It doesn't matter whether it's the most corporate commercial farming company or a proper old traditional farming business. All of them should have a corporate business management plan in place that includes either a risk register or a risk profile. Also, build relationships. Bank managers, landlords, um, grain merchants, suppliers are all going to get extremely important in the next few years. Build resilience, take nothing for granted, take this opportunity to get help get your farms prepared for storms ahead um, and use the Monitor Farm programme to analyse difficult subjects and, and help find the solutions. We've got 20 Monitor Farms across the UK at the moment. Uh, we are recruiting for more to meet the demand and fill in gaps and fill in holes in the geography. Uh, I would encourage any of you that haven't been long to a meeting to give it a try. They are an excellent way of exploring the various issues and options we're facing at the moment without actually having to do them yourself. Uh, and I think they're an absolutely vital part of finding industry resilience going forward. You can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. Thank you very much. <laughs>